Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. All right, Bobby Alarazai. Did I say it correctly, Alarazai? Very well, very well. How's it going? I I have to uh, tell you the truth here. Uh, I asked Kevin Flippin how to say it about an hour ago, just to make sure I didn't completely botch it up. Uh, Bobby, Bobby, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Great to have you uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, looking forward to it. We connected to you through Tim Clark, and I was reconnected to Tim through Kevin Flippin. Tim's been on, Kevin's been on now. I had the opportunity to talk to you. I'm uh, really looking forward to it. And I should say that you and Tim are brothers-in-law. Yes. Tim married your sister. Yeah, and I told him not to take her too far away from me, and he picked up, picked her up and went to North Carolina. Right. He's uh, almost like a state and a half away kind of thing. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, li- you live in Northern Virginia, right? Or is it D.C.? Uh, Northern Virginia. Yeah, I'm in uh, Centerville right now. Very cool. Now, you were not born in the States. You were born overseas. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Iran, uh, in the capital city in Tehran. Do you and you left at the tender age of nine or ten? Is that right? Uh, yeah, nine and a half, ten ish. It was uh, nineteen seventy nine. It was a year I, I remember quite well because I was uh, ten years old at, at the time. So before we talk about leaving Iran, let, let's talk about what it was like uh, living in Iran as a seven or eight year old kid. Um, from you know the little bit that I do remember. Um, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, of course I didn't have any, uh, you know, frame of reference as to how else life could be, uh, like most people. Um, but, uh, uh Tehran was, uh, you know, just an, an urban city. I remember the hustle and bustle. We lived in the suburbs, but it was still kind of, uh, busy there. And, um, uh, I do remember, you know, car rides and, and trips and, uh, going downtown on the weekends. Uh, well in Iran, the weekend is Friday. So mm, yeah. um, uh, Friday is the, is a day that everybody's well, most people are off from work. And uh, I remember, you know, Friday nights going out with uh, my parents um, before my sister was born and, uh, um, and, we, and a little bit after she was born, too. Um, but we used to go out, uh, you know, to restaurants with with friends. And, uh, you know, I had some some little friends uh, of, of, you know, friends of theirs who had, who had kids when we were you know, knew each other and would run around and play. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a, my, an urban city, hustle and bustle, you know, uh, everything you would expect uh, from any other major city, major did hotels. Know, did you much know about anything outside of Tehran? Uh, not too much. No. Um, just a little bit of access that we had through uh, to like television and, you know, some uh, uh, non-Iranian programming. A lot of American programming uh, that I do kind of remember, but uh, I don't know. Some of it might have been British, and I just didn't know. Uh, but uh, that was that was uh, the extent of it. I um, mean, we did go used to go see uh, go to the movies and things like that. I, I distinctly remember my mom taking me to see Godzilla when it first came out, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I can't remember what year it was, but it was the first one, <laughs> yeah, the, the original, yeah, yeah, the original, not the, not the remix, obviously. Um, uh, but yeah, outside of that, I didn't know, know much. Yeah, in the 70s, there was no internet. So you had television, movies, and, and I guess games in the house to, to entertain you. But uh, yeah, no, no internet right. distractions. It was actually, I, people are tired of me saying this, but I, I really enjoyed growing up in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, it was nice. Um, you know, you had to kind of figure things out and everything wasn't laid out for you. And like you said, there's no internet. So, you know, if you wanted to do something you really had to have an interest in it and, and pursue it as opposed to just sitting at home and kind of googling it nowadays and uh you know so yeah it was a good time very cool what did your parents do for a living in Tehran? Uh, my mom was an educator uh she was a teacher and uh an administrator later on when i, when I can remember um and i'll tell you a funny story about marbles uh later on or uh, whenever it comes up uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh so she was in the school work in the school system and my dad worked in uh in, in the import and export business so he was always uh you know taking trips and and uh going out of town and and things like that so very cool so uh when you were nine and a half years old t- talk to me about the 
the days and weeks leading up to that? Did you know something was changing in your country in, in 79 or is it literally it all happened in a one or two day period? Um, it seems like it happened quickly, you know, thinking about it now, but, um, uh, you know, I, I do remember, uh, some, some unrest, um, uh, and, and some, I guess, anxiety. I didn't know what anxiety was, but now when I look back at it, you know, you know, uh, anxiety, uh, you know, from friends and family there, um, I do remember, uh, being out on, on uh, one of our balconies at our house, playing like I normally would do every day. And um, all of a sudden I started hearing a lot of uh, car horns being blown. Mm. Usually, you know, when, it, when you're celeb you know, in a celebratory type of way. So all the cars were honking the horns and things like, you know, I'm a kid, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, and uh, later on I found out that that's when the Shah had actually left the country. He had, you know, decided to, to leave because uh, his life was in danger. Um, and the people were celebrating, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, in hindsight. You know, but at that time, they thought that was the best thing ever. So I do remember that. Uh, I don't remember uh, the timeline as to, you know, how, how, how long it was before then, before we kind of got our things together. But I do remember some of the processes. So the Shah left, and then you, you and your sister and your parents left days later. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how many days it was. It may have been a few weeks uh, while they kind of got things uh, uh, together. Um, I do remember uh, uh, going into my room and seeing a lot of my things packed up in boxes, and I knew that we were, uh, you know, leaving to come to the United States. Um, and I, I remember what, there was a big box that a bunch of my toys were in. And at the time I thought that was the box that we were gonna take with us, you know, the, the, my toys in, in addition to whatever else. I didn't realize we were just gonna leave with a couple of suitcases. Mm. So I thought this big box of toys was, was the toys that my parents had planned on bringing for me with us. So I opened it and I started to repack it. I remember, you know, saying, Oh, I want this. I want, I want to take this with me. So I kind of like unpacked it a little bit and repacked it and put a couple of other things in there. Um, but unfortunately none of that stuff made it out with us, but I do yeah. remember that. Did, did you speak uh, Farsi or English in the, in your house? Uh, Farsi, Farsi. Um, uh, my parents, uh, even before any of this happened, while I was in uh, elementary school, well, not elementary school, but uh, in school, um, my parents made me take English classes um, after school. So there was just a handful of kids that stayed after school and everybody else went home. And uh, there were a couple of English classes. So I remember taking English classes and wondering, you know, why do I have to take English classes? I just want to go home with, you know, when everybody else goes home. Um, but um, I, I didn't, um, I didn't really learn English. I, I didn't, I, you know, it didn't get far enough where I could have a conversation. It wasn't conversational, but, you know, I, I guess it, it set a good foundation. But um, the one word I remember always uh, trying to spell was exercise. I don't know why that stuck with me all these years, <laughs> but I remember, a, you know, a test, a spelling test, and I, exercise, and I, that always stuck with me. But yeah, so I, I, I did take English classes, but uh, we didn't, uh, no one knew how to speak English. And, in our and was, was, did your mom anticipate that you guys would eventually live in America at some point? Or is it just she thought it was a good idea because English was being spoken uh, throughout most of the world? Yeah, I think that, that that's what, the, what their thought process was, that it, uh, uh, it's uh, kind of a, a universal language and it's uh, it'll be uh, something nice uh, for for me to uh, learn. So what so the Shah, was he elected democratically or was he basically like British royalty? like the royal family in Britain was say hundreds of years ago. Was, was it more, it was family lineage sort of thing for the Shah? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was uh, definitely loyal, uh, royalty. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, essentially he was kicked out of the country. Yeah. Yeah. By, I, I guess essentially a, an opposition that had been, been growing in power for quite some time. Um, yeah. Uh, and from what I understand, the United States had played a big role in that. Um, you know, kind of behind the scenes, then, well, uh, you know, as you grow up and, and you see the other things that happen around the world and you realize, uh, you know, the hand that the United States kind of plays in these political uh, uh, issues around the globe, 
Um, and then it kind of hits home. You're like, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I always remember my, my parents and my uncles and my uh, dad always talking about politics and things and, and discussing the, uh, the, the details. And I wasn't really paying attention, attention, like, but I, but later on, I realized I did absorb some of it. Um, so yes, the U S did play a, a major role in that. Um, and, and, uh, and from, from what I understood, just like 90% of the conflict around the world, it had something to do with the uh, Iran's oil reserves, and hoping to get access to a cheaper, uh, you know, uh, oil oil prices. From what I understand, I could be completely wrong, but um, that was, uh, you know, the main reason they got involved and kind of encouraged the Shah to leave, even though the opposition um, was growing in Iran. But the uh, the Iranian military w- was one of the strongest in the region and had been for decades. So if the Shah uh, wanted to you know, do something against the, the citizens, he could have easily shut it down. But um, I remember my, my mom telling me that, that there was some discussion uh, and that the Shah had decided, you know, these are my people. Um, it would be wrong for me to harm them in any way just so I can stay here and stay in power. And if they want me to leave, then I'll leave so that I don't have to hurt or harm any of them through military action. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, so he pretty much left what it was goes down in history as having been exiled yeah and look i the shaw was a uh from what you just described was uh, decent enough not to kill his, his own citizens uh and i wish the same was true in syria with the uh assad regime he he absolutely is willing to use his military against his own people to stay in power uh yeah i, I it's, Which a, is a, it's hard unfortunate. to fathom it's hard yeah. to fathom how anybody yeah. gets to that place. Yeah. Yeah. So you, let's go back to your, your stuff is being packed up and, and some other things are being packed to, to stay behind. But you, you're traveling with sounds like two or three suitcases. Did you fly out of the main international airport? Did you uh, take a car out of the How did you get out of the country? Um, at that at that point, it was still fairly early uh, in the uh, in the revolution. So I, I do remember going to the airport. I remember there was a lot of chaos um, and uh, my mom holding me close. There was a lot of family crying and, um, and I, I still didn't fully understand it. Um, uh, but yeah, we flew out of uh, the major airport. There was some fear, uh, you know, because uh, they were still apprehending people uh, trying to leave the country. Um, I'm not, we're not, we're not uh, Muslim, uh, we're Baha'is, and uh, uh, Baha'is uh, in Iran um, uh, had always been looked down upon, um, things had been better uh, with the Shah, um, but once the uh, Islamic regime took over, the, you know, that all came back, you know, the, all the, the persecution, the, the discrimination and all that stuff. So there was some fear about uh, them not letting us leave the country, um, even though they didn't want us there to begin with, which is kind of odd. But um, so, yeah, then, har- yeah there was some har- har- fear. Horribly ironic, Bobby. Spell, spell Baha'i? Uh, B-A-H-A apostrophe I. OK, got it. And what's what's the, the derivation of Baha'i? How did it start? Um, so uh, similar to all religions, the, the, the basic foundation is the same, you know, uh, love, unity, understanding, kindness, generosity. Um, but, you know, there are some uh, different uh, or other principles uh, that uh, differentiated, I guess, from some of the older religions. And um we do believe in all religions, uh, uh, but the Baha'i religion uh, teaches that, um, well, well, it's called progressive revelation. And the best analogy to give would be uh, like a child growing up and going through school and, and learning. So the Baha'is believe that all religions are valid we respect and accept all religions, uh, but we, we believe that different religions were introduced to, to uh, uh, humanity based on humanity's comprehension level uh, of that time. 
and each religion builds on the previous religion, the, the foundations. But then you introduce new ideas because uh, people have advanced and, and, and evolved and, and kind of, you know, their, their, uh, their just view of, of things have, have expanded. Uh, and that's why I use the, uh, the school analogies because, you know, when you go to start school, when you go to kindergarten, you're not going to teach a kindergarten trigonometry. Um, you're going to teach them one, two, three, red, green, blue, you know, the basics. And then when they go to the first grade, what they learn in first grade builds on the foundation of what they learn in kindergarten. And then when you go to second grade, you know, so as you advance, your, your teachings, your education advances based on your ability to comprehend them. And that's the way we view religion and, and why, you know, every thousand years or so, uh, a new religion is introduced because humanity has evolved to a point where they can uh, accept maybe more than anything else, new ideas. How far back does Baha'i go? Um, it started in 1844. Mm. Uh, so it's fairly new. And that's why uh, Muslims don't view it as a valid religion. Um, and that's why the persecution and, and the discrimination uh, was happening. Uh, they just didn't respect it as a valid religion and said that it was fake and it was a cult. Um, and they labeled a lot of the uh, Baha'is as traitors or spies and, and things like that. Um, did, it start, to, did it start in Iran? It did start in Iran, yeah. Okay. And how many practice today around the world? I don't know the exact number, but um it's it's quite a bit it's uh, the, uh it has spread out throughout the entire world it's on every continent um i, I don't want to say a number and be, be wrong i'm sorry <laughs> yeah it's all good yeah but but it's, but it's, but it's a significant number not not, yeah. I mean, not not significant if you compare it to christianity for example um but uh for it to be as as new as it is per se it, it is a significant number yeah, and every religion seems to have a central figure to it. Is there a central figure for Baha'i? Yes. Uh, our, the name of our prophet is uh, Baha'u'llah. Okay. And he lived in Iran? Uh, yeah. Since it started there? Yeah, yeah. Um, he, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the, the, the negativity, the persecution and everything, he was banished from Iran. He was imprisoned for, for many years. Uh, then he was uh, uh, exiled um, to different countries. Um, because his followers kept growing. Um, but uh, the exile uh, was kind of a blessing in disguise because had he not been exiled, he wouldn't have been able to, to, to find new followers in other countries. So, um, you know, they, they did it to be cruel, but uh, it actually helped the religion to grow. Yeah. Cool. So let's go back to you're in the airport. Your, your mom is clutching you and your sister. Your dad, I'm, I, I'm guessing, was trying to figure out how to, to get you on a flight out of the country. And you intended to make it to the States as your sort of uh, next permanent destination. Is that fair or, or is there a different yeah. plan? Uh, no, no, that was a plan. Now, um, it wasn't completely unplanned because we have family here already. Um, uh, my uh, aunt, one of my dad's uh, sisters, uh, they had moved to the U.S. a few years earlier, and uh, and I, you know, when I when I try to think of when they came, um, uh, it's, it's uh, funny to me. I guess it might not be funny to anybody else, but I think of Star Wars because I remember my dad coming to the U.S. to visit them. This is before the revolution and all this chaos happened, and he brought back a Star Wars Darth Vader watch for me. Mm. So it had to be around when Star Wars came out. So 77, 70, you know, somewhere yeah, around there. 70, 77, 78, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, roughly about a year. But the, the reason my aunt uh, and uncle came to the U.S. was because uh, one of my cousins was diagnosed with leukemia. And um, he went through all the treatments and he could, you know, uh, in Iran. And, and uh, they, they said that, you know, uh, we've done all we can. And the next best place to go is, uh, uh, is the United States for treatment. So uh, they moved here for him to go through his uh, leukemia treatment. Uh, unfortunately, he ended up passing away. Mm. Uh, and because he was buried here in the United States, um, they stayed. So and that's how we ended up here, because we had family to come and stay with. 
temporarily until we figured out what was going to happen back home. So T- Tehran, you probably stopped somewhere in Europe on the way to the U.S. Did you land in D.C. or, or New York? Um, I think we landed in Seattle. Oh, Washington. you went the other way. I think so. And, and the reason I, I think, and I, I could have easily asked my parents, but I remember them saying we just landed in Washington. And then, and I was confused because I was thinking, then why do we have to catch another flight? Because we're going to Washington. But we were, you know, they were telling us we're going to Washington, D.C. But the fact that we had landed in Washington, you know, I was 10 years old. I didn't, I, I didn't know geography, U.S. geography. So I was confused. So that's why I think, yeah, so we, we landed in Seattle and then, and then flew there. But I don't remember if we connected somewhere in Europe uh, or someplace else before coming to, you know, landing in, in Seattle. Yeah, so I, I've, I've been to the Middle East, uh, and when I flew from the East Coast, we flew east, stopped in a couple places in Europe, and then eventually made it into the Middle East. Um, it sounds like Tehran to Seattle to D.C. is maybe the, the course you took. Right. Which is, I, I get, yeah, it's roughly halfway around the world, so I guess you could go either direction. Either way, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. the beltway. <laughs> That's right. So w- when you land, when, when you got to D.C., you, you had family that could help you get uh, situated, get acquainted with uh, what life was like. Were you in the in the burbs or were you in uh, D.C. proper as a as a 10 year old? Uh, no, we uh, they lived in Arlington. So um, we uh, stayed with them until we could find an apartment. Um, and then we ended up staying close to them because it didn't make sense to go far away from from family. So we stayed uh, uh, in the same apartment development. Um, but yeah, we that's we ended up uh, in Arlington. Yeah, and uh, what was the adjustment like for you from Tehran to basically Metro DC? Um, I remember being scared because I didn't speak the language. Um, but I, I think I, I adjusted fairly well, um, made some friends. Um, I enjoyed going to school. Um, and I remember initially having a difficult time communicating with my friends and kind of, you know, getting my point across to them. Uh, you know, just a couple of kids that I had met in the neighborhood. Um, but we made it work. You know, we, uh, we, we, we played and, you know, uh, sometimes I had, it was almost like sign language, but I didn't really know, sign, you know, so it was like trying to explain to them with hand gestures and things. Cause I couldn't verbally explain things, but um, overall, I, I don't remember, I don't have any negative thoughts or memories about that time. Uh, there were some issues in school where kids would pick on me, especially during a hostage, the, the Iranian hostage crisis where some kids would push me around and say, you know, bring our hostages back. And I'm like, dude, I'm like 11 years old. I have nothing to do with this. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but you know, 11, 11 year olds, 11 year olds are not very worldly, Bobby. No, no. And I, and I I couldn't, you know, I didn't have the president's phone number to call and say, can we get the, uh, the hostages (laughs) back? Cause I'm having a hard time here at school. Yeah. So Mm. yeah. You know, that whole go back to your country and go, go, to where you came from and then unfortunately 40 years later people still still say that to people but really yeah i experienced it uh you know i mean they don't, like, they don't tell me to go back but you know with the whole immigration and and right 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 you know you know go back to your country go back to where you came from not realizing that you know everybody's an immigrant here the only true american is the american indian everyone else is either an immigrant or a descendant of immigrants but that's that's absolutely right Try to explain that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, we're not very good at our own history here in this country, uh, typically. Yeah. So, uh, when did you become fluent in English? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't, I don't remember. Were you in um, high school, middle school? No, it was way before then. Yeah, I was probably okay. so when I came here, I, I, I was in fourth grade. I was I came in like in the middle of the school year, fourth grade. I think by the by sixth grade i think i was i was uh pretty you know uh pretty well able to communicate um i I remember being in esl classes um and you know being pulled away from the 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 main class and 
you know, you know taking over over to the ESL area or the ESL room and uh, you know learning English with you know other other kids who didn't speak English you know Spanish and Asian and all you know all kind of demographics um, but um, I, I don't remember how long it took me it was definitely way before I it didn't take me long uh, Farsi is not similar to English at all there's nothing no. similar about them right nothing the alphabet is completely different it's not like you know German or or Spanish where the alphabet is the same, but you just kind of got to figure out what means what and what the accents mean. The alphabet is completely different, as you know, the Arabic uh, alphabet. Um, and then uh, we write from uh, right to left, as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the uh, English language where it's left to right. So it was a complete uh, change for me. Yeah, it's... Uh... I can't imagine trying to learn Farsi as, as a 10, 11, 12 year old kid. I couldn't imagine, but you got to do what you got to do. Necessity is the mother of all kinds of things, right? It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so did you, were you super well integrated into what was going on uh, in your neighborhood, in your school, or were you kind of kept at a distance socially and from a society perspective? Did you, did you feel like an American at some point in school? Um, Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I don't remember really not feeling like I didn't belong, and I, I don't remember when I made that switch to I'm Iranian to I'm Iranian American. Um, but I really never really felt out of place per se. You know, with the exception of those couple of incidents, you know, where kids would pick on you. Um, but yeah. Um, and I guess a part of that was the diversity of Northern Virginia, even at that time, even though it's a lot more diverse now. But um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, my, I had like three best friends that, that you know, lived in the same apartment uh, complex. Uh, one was African-American, one was Filipino, and the other one was German. Mm. And of course, we had, you know, other friends, but that was our little, little tight group. So I didn't, you know, didn't really feel out of place. I think uh, my my uh, buddy who's Filipino may have been born here, um, uh, and even my my German friend I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, but yeah, we we just all kind of got along, and and uh, I don't really remember when that transition happened where where I felt you know I, I never really felt like I didn't belong. I don't I, you know I, I didn't attach American or, or or anything else to it. You're just being a kid, kid trying just being to be a kid, along, yeah. you know, just trying to. Yeah, this is this is where we're going to live now. Um, I wasn't sure if we were going to go back uh, to Iran. Uh, but, you know, you just kind of, OK, this is this is where we are, just where I live. This is the, the you know, the things I have to learn. And these are my friends. Yeah. When, when you were in that ESL class, were there other uh, Farsi speaking kids in the class? No, I was I was the only one. So were there other folks of Iranian descent uh, living in that area outside of your family? Were there other families uh, there? There were. Yeah, there were, um, but uh, I, I didn't go to school with with any of their kids. Like um, uh, I remember, we had some family in, in Vienna, um, and they went to school, and you know, in the Vienna, Vienna, uh, and uh, you know, I was in the Arlington school system. Uh, so, and we, you know, we uh, met other family members, other, other uh, uh, Iranians uh, as time went by. Um, I remember a time where it was it was weird or odd to run into another Iranian person or family or like at a grocery store or something um, because it was just so rare to, to see someone else that you didn't know outside of your immediate family. And you would immediately, you know, greet each other and say hello. And, and, and you know, you had that camaraderie there. Um, and then at some point it just wasn't odd anymore. <laughs> yeah. It just stopped being a thing. You stopped working. Yeah, about it. yeah, because because it, it just became um, more normal. You you see more and more Iranians, uh, you know, uh, everywhere. So it wasn't as a a huge shock to say, "Oh my God, you're from Iran too." Oh, you know. So yeah, wow. So uh, wh where'd you go to college? I went to uh, uh, Northern Virginia Community College. Okay. And um, uh, what, what were you going to do? What, what, what well, were you going uh, to school? I studied computer programming and 
I uh, unfortunately never finished because I, um, well, I got involved in DJing. So that took, took me, you know, distracted me. Now that I look back, probably wasn't a good thing. Um, <laughs> well, hold on, hold on. Let, me, let me pause for our listeners here because they will they won't see the video. Your background is a legitimate background and you've got two turntables, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. One of them you can't see in the, in the uh, you know, I can adjust that. Yeah, you, you got to have two. You have two turntables. You can. It looks like you can spin up to what four vinyls at a time. Um, depending on the equipment you have, but uh, two is is uh, really all the, you need. Really all you need, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and then and then I, you have to have what appears to be hundreds, if not well over a thousand albums behind you in shelves. Oh yeah. Well, this uh, I'm in a townhouse right now. Um, I get, I can uh, give you the. Yeah. Quick run, but um, the records you see behind me, uh, roughly about three thousand. Oh, that's that's a ton. Rough. It is a ton, but wait till I tell you how many I own. Okay, my my total collection is somewhere in the neighborhood of forty thousand. Wait a minute, forty thousand vinyl or forty thousand vinyl plus CDs plus any other form they come in. It's all vinyl. Forty thousand vinyl, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! How many do du- yeah. are there duplicates in that, or is they're all well, unique? I, there are there are duplicates because uh, the style of DJing that I do, uh, a lot of times we use duplicates because we go back and forth between the same song and repeat certain phrases um, or or the break in the song. I, I, I predominantly spin hip hop, um, and uh, so and we do call it doubles um you know there's a the funny saying that you know real djs have doubles um and mainly that's because of, of the singles because uh, uh the hip-hop uh industry and culture um aside from the albums was heavily based on 12-inch singles um initially because when a musician you know when an artist put out a song they didn't they may not have had enough songs to put out an entire album but uh they want to put out a song so they would put release a single uh the single would, would uh, j- uh typically have the the uh, the album version which had you know uncensored version uh clean radio version uh and an instrumental version mm. And then it may have had an, an acapella where it was just the vocals. That, uh, and then DJs would manipulate that. So you would take the vocals from one song and, and put it, mix it over top of an instrumental from another song uh, and kind of create your own, you know, you'd, uh, be creative and create your own song out of it. But the reason you needed the doubles was because you, you wanted the instrumental and you wanted the vocal version and you would go back and forth. And then, um, you know, you would mix the instrumental in and then you would bring the vocals in. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility and creativity to have two copies of it. But f- as far as albums, you know, for the most part, I have single, uh, you know, one copy of the albums, but a lot of the 12 inch singles, you, you, you know, for DJing purposes, you would have to, you know, get doubles. Yeah. But, single, um, the singles had, had an A side where the, the, what they thought would be a hit or what they hoped would be a hit was on the A side. And then they had an accompanying song on the B side. Yeah. And the B side, and usually the B side was better. <laughs> the record, you know, the record execs, have never known what's good <laughs> right yeah do, sort, sort of uh the george costanza from side and do the opposite of what the execs want to do and you probably will end up in a good place yeah exactly exactly so wait so wait a minute For, let's i just want to say this forty thousand. even if you if you assume an average of ten dollars per album that's a lot of money that's a lot of money yeah it is, it's, it a is lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money um I mean, I, it, it's uh, it's a collection that I've I've built over the last uh, forty years, uh, but but yeah, it's a lot of money. So you you were still a kid in school when you started uh, buying albums. Sounds like. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I started in uh, in high school uh, when um, I would I would save my allowance money, um, and and you know just go to Waxy Maxies or whatever local record store was was in our in our area and buy whatever they had. And um, as I got older, I would, uh, you know, take the metro or, or, or the subway uh, to D.C. and go to Tower Records because they had a much larger selection there. Um, and that was and, and then uh, there were uh, record stores in D.C. Uh, that specialized in uh, music catered towards DJ. So so mm-hmm. the majority of their selections were uh, singles as opposed to albums you know, that people would buy just to listen to at home. They catered to more of the DJ uh, clientele. Um, so they had a lot more singles. So then we traveled to DC, uh, save up our money. And, you know, uh, it was uh, 
go go to DC and, and buy as many as we could afford. Like a kid in the candy store for you. Oh yeah, yeah. Still, still to this day. What, anytime what, I travel, anytime I go anywhere, I'm always googling local record stores. <laughs> there aren't that many as there were when when you and I were kids. No, not that many, but uh, they are starting to pop back up. They are popping back up. Um, record sales um, have increased uh, or have surpassed CD sales uh, year after year for the past uh, several years. Uh, so a lot of records. So now they tend to be more used records uh, than new, but a lot of artists are releasing their music on, on vinyl again because they realize that you know people want something tangible that they can hold in their hand and. You know, it you you make a little bit more more money doing it that way, and a lot of artists now release things in, uh, independently, so it's not you know so they make more and more money that way. Uh, MP3 might you know I might I might like one song and give you ninety nine cents, but I'll buy your whole album is you know twenty five thirty bucks. Yeah, nostalgia is pretty powerful too. My seventeen year old daughter is really into 60s and 70s classic rock, especially British rock. And she's got Ooh. three milk, milk crates of, of vinyl today. So she's headed to 40,000, I think, uh, by the time she's your age. Oh, Possibly. Man. Yeah, yeah she, she loves she loves vinyl. She Her jaw would be on the floor right now if she saw what you had behind you. <laughs> and that's less than 10% of what you got. That's less than 10%, yeah. If you if you uh, take what I have back behind me, which is about 3,000, multiply roughly about 13 if you multiply by 13 that's that's uh how many records i have so that, and which is why i don't have it here in my townhouse because um it wouldn't fit it would look like an episode of hoarders you you need my, 12 12 townhouses to i need 12 that. townhouses right now yeah 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 so. <laughs> that's great so when did the idea of djing become a thing for you so uh what uh it was in 83 84 Four ish. Um, well, so when I when we first came to the United States in 1979, uh, uh, one of the first or the first uh, rap song that I heard was "Rapper's Delight," and mm. which was huge in '79. It was released and it was huge, and I heard that on the radio, and it was unlike anything I had ever heard in my life. And I was like, "What is this?" Um, and and I immediately fell in love with with hip hop, and. Um, I remember not knowing how to speak English properly, but I could sing that song word for word uh, from beginning to end. And it was a seven minute song. The original version of that song is like a little over seven minutes. So um, that kind of kicked things off. And um, uh, when, when uh, breakdancing became popular in the early eighties, um, I got it. I was into that. And of course, the music was was uh, heavily influenced by hip hop and, and uh, um, you know, everything uh, out of New York. So um, I got into uh, breakdancing and uh, the music that we wanted to to dance to wasn't readily available on on uh, commercial radio where you could just record. I mean, we were recording other other stuff on the radio on our cassette decks and and, and playing it. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, that kind of music wasn't readily available. And so we would go to the record stores and try to find, you know, things. And that's how I started my record collection. Um, initially I was buying, you know, rock music. Um, I have some uh, Van Halen, uh, some Iron Maiden, uh, ACDC, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then as I got into hip hop, I started buying more. And like I was saying, uh, you know, I save up my allowance, go buy a couple of records and, I, and then I would record the songs on a cassette tape and take it to school with me. And we would play it on our boom boxes and we would practice after school, practice breakdancing after school. Um, and then uh, we started to do some uh, shows at school. Like they would ask us, hey, you want to come and, uh, you know, uh, do dance routines uh, in, uh, in the, fa in a, you know, like the uh, uh, talent show. Uh, and we did. And it was obviously a hit because all the kids were, were loving it. Uh, you know, and we were practicing different routines and things. Uh, uh, mainly for performances so that we could have synchronized routines. But back then there was this thing called, uh, you know, like it was competitive. So there were uh, uh, crews in other areas that were also doing the same thing. So if you ever came across somebody and they challenged you, you had to be able to hold your own um, or as a crew. And I remember being in a couple of, you know, crew battles where, you know, it was us versus them and you know all these kids around it was it was, it was amazing time um but i would record these songs for these practices and then we would do it you know uh 
for the talent shows and then uh, any kind of show that was at school that would ask us to perform in. We do the intermission at um, like for plays uh, in school. Um, through that, I through uh, just you know getting a break dance and I got into graffiti art, so I, I became a graffiti artist. And um, you get so, in trouble you know, for that? Uh, I, uh, let me think. Almost a bunch of times. <laughs> Then you were you, you were a bit, you were a good graffiti artist because that's half the job. That not getting that's the half right. the job. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you have to have a look at. It. I remember one time we were at the back of this uh, shopping center and we were doing this huge mural, um, and it was like three, four of us, and each one of us decided we're going to take this section and we we're just doing a huge mural and writing our names and you know full color, not just the tag. You know, the, the tag is when you just quickly write your name and, and get going, um, but uh, uh, we we're doing pieces, uh, art. You know, pieces. They call it pieces, but it's because it's called you know, piece of art. Um, right. And we had, we had a guy looking around the corner and uh, he came running. He's like, the cops, the cops. And as soon as we look over, there's these guys, like, it reminded me of Chips. You know, they were on their motorcycles, like on Chips. Right. The, the, the Palicia. We just, the, it was a break in the, in the fence that separated the back of the shopping center um, and, and the uh, apartment of, uh, complex that was there. So we all ran through there, hid in different, you know, kind of split up. I don't know why we knew to split up. That's like borderline criminal to, as a kid to know you got to split up. <laughs> and um, I remember hiding in a laundry room um, and, uh, and waiting for the because the police were walking around asking the kids, have you seen anybody coming around here? And then so then we we changed clothes so that, we did, you know, if somebody identified us, we wouldn't look the same. And then we and then we all went like different directions and we're like, all right, we're going to meet back at, you know, at home. But you go that way. I'm going this way. You go. And we split up. And it was a close call, but, but we we pulled it off. And they so, they they weren't going to pursue you on foot. They were they wanted to stay on their motorcycles, I imagine. Well, they, well, they did pursue us on foot, but they couldn't get through that fence as easily. So uh, by the time they got out there uh, to to question people if they had seen us, um, we had already found good hiding places, and you know went into like apartment buildings or like we hid. Like me and another friend of mine, we hid in the laundry room. Uh, my parents are probably going to listen to this and they'd be like, what? Um, <laughs> the statute of <laughs> limitations are uh, way gone, I, I imagine. Way gone. Like, what are they going to do? They're going to punish me? <laughs> <laughs> it's what, sounds like it was well over 30 years ago. I'm pretty sure the statute's like five years at most. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, wait a minute. Break dancing. What, what, what was your best move? Um, so, my signature move was doing a, a handspin where you put your arm on your stomach and you balance yourself on one hand mm. and you would, you would spin on, yeah. on one hand. Well, because I was a graffiti artist and because we were always trying to be creative and, and have one up on the next person that might challenge us, I decided, you know what? Let me take a spray paint can with the top on it and see if I can balance myself on this can of spray paint and spin on that. And, you know, if, if, if you've ever, you know, handled a can of spray paint, you know, the, 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 the top isn't attached, you know, it, it turns. Right. So, you know, you got to kind of force it to come off so it doesn't come off easily. So it worked perfectly. I was able to practice it and balance myself. So that was my signature move um, to, to balance myself on a can of spray paint and spin indefinitely without falling over and everything. And then I remember um, at one of the uh, talent shows, uh, they said, hey, man, you should do it on like a, a, a Coke can. I was like, cool, but it had to be empty. So then you had to balance yourself pretty well so that the can, you know, because if you went off to the side slightly, the pressure would, would crush the can and you would fall over. So I mastered that. And mm. those were my specialty moves. So I could spin on an empty can of uh, a, a, a Coke can. And uh, back then it was pretty impressive, I must say. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm guessing you can't pull off your signature moves these days. No, no. <laughs> I, I think that the can would crush immediately, um, uh, partially from sloppiness and uh, extra body weight. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you the last time you did that move? I think it was uh, not uh, too much later than high school. So um, late teens, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's it sounds incredibly hard. I can't imagine even when I was a lot lighter than I am now pull, being able to pull that off. That took a lot of that took a ton of practice, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I crushed a lot of uh, uh, coke cans. 
uh, in the process. But not not a big deal. But yeah, yeah, we, you know. But but we like I was saying, we we literally practiced every day after school. Um, you know, different moves because like there, there like there were no internet. There was no internet, so we couldn't. And there were no schools for this. There weren't any. I mean, right now you can go to you can sign up for a dance class. It may not be break dancing, but they're break dancers that will teach you. Um, you can go take DJing classes. So you can take all kind. You a, a, a good buddy of mine who, who's uh, a long time graffiti artist uh, teaches graffiti art uh, to people that want to learn. We didn't have any of that. You know, we we saw it on music videos. We saw it on uh, on on TV. There was a documentary that came out called Star Wars. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was like 83. Uh, and it was all about New York graffiti. And that just blew our mind. Mm. Um, so we would look at these, the imagery, even with the music, we listen to the songs and listen to the DJs scratching and, and the sounds it made. We really didn't know how, how, that, how that happened. Um, so it was just a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error um, and kind of figuring it out as, as we, as we went, went along. So, uh, it was definitely a process. Uh, do you have any pictures of your art? Um, let me see. I have, yeah, I have a t-shirt that I did. It's, it's, it's airbrushed. I did it years later. For our listeners, Bobby is fetching a cool shirt. Wow. That's gorgeous. Yeah, that's that's really pretty. Thank you. You did that. You did that by hand. I did this by hand. This is my airbrush because uh, you know on a t-shirt, um, yeah. the spray paint nozzle would be uh, you know too wide to to, to shrink it this low. Right. So um, you know uh, I did it with an airbrush, but yeah, I could uh, replicate this with spray paint on a wall. So uh, yeah, thank you. You're t- you're talented, man. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. All, all, right, all just- illegal stuff, like partially <laughs> illegal stuff. I'm talented in the arts of uh... <laughs> break break, break dancing has uh, always been legal, uh, but definitely not yes. wasn't widespread uh, back when you were doing it. Oh no! How, you're talking no. about crew, your crew. How big was your crew? How many folks were in it? Um, a good five or five, four or five, but then we had you know folks that kind of hung around us may not have practiced as much so they didn't feel confident enough in in you know performing with us uh so the core was about five or you know five or six okay cool and, and what surface were you on when you when you did this typically like so, if you're, um, if you're in, in, inside i i can see the floor being okay inside but if you're outside were you on cardboard yeah yeah you had to be on cardboard because it was you know you could find cardboard laying around and piece it together with, with, you know, tape, uh, and, and make it big enough. I remember I had a piece of cardboard. I even, you know, did graffiti on it, but I had it, had it so I can fold it up and kind of, mm. you know, and carry it with us and unfold it where we went. And then, you know, I, at some point, uh, we pool our money together and, uh, bought some linoleum mm. and that was a big deal. We you know, went to one of these flooring shops and like yeah can we, you know can, can we get like five five square feet of linoleum and i'm like what um so yeah so then we had this big roll of a lo- uh, linoleum that it took three of us to carry um but if we happen to be you know going to like uh doing a performance at, at a uh uh what do you call it a, a school um um damn i can't even think right now I'm getting so excited, maybe uh, good. like out- outdoors, like on a basketball court or something. You know, if you want to right. go outside on a Saturday, you know, you couldn't practice in school. So, um, yeah, then we just take that with us. And, and you know, because you can you can do, do moves on the ground on, on, on concrete and stuff and asphalt. You tear yourself up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you wouldn't you couldn't spin. Yeah. No, you really couldn't. Yeah. 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 So do you remember your first uh, DJ gig? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tell, and, tell, um, me, tell, tell me about that. It, it, and it, it and it wasn't really I didn't even think of it as a DJ gig, but that's what what uh, got me thinking maybe I could DJ. So we, the the music that we wanted to to break dance to, or and then just in general hip hop wasn't readily available. So we I would go to this record store and buy the records, and then um, I remember somebody saying, "Hey, you know Bobby has a bunch of hip hop records," and somebody was having a house party, and uh, you know using their their uh, parents' uh, stereo system in, in the uh, community center. 
uh, clubhouse or whatever. So it was like one turntable, you know, regular house speakers or whatever. So there was no mixing involved. I didn't know how to do that yet. But it was like, hey, you have all these records. Can you bring your records and just play them for us? I was like, yeah, I can do that. I didn't even think of it as DJ. I was like, I'm taking my records to this party and I'm just going to play some songs that I like. And hopefully people will like it and they'll dance too um, with one turntable. And then I did that. And I was like, yeah, you know, that was, that was pretty fun. That was cool. And then I, um, I met this guy in high school who, who had moved down uh, from New York. And, you know, he was immersed in that whole culture. And um, he had a turntable and he had a mixer, a mixing console where you can mix uh, the audio from two different inputs. And he would bring it to my house after school and he would bring his turntable, his mixer, and then I would take my dad's turntable and we'd have a DJ set up. So mm. we didn't practice scratching and it was, it sounded horrible, uh, but you had to practice. So, you know, we thought we were doing something, but it, it, it led to. All yeah. This. Well, so <laughs> when you scratch, are you, are you destroying the, uh, the vinyl? Uh, no, uh, there, there are special needle uh, needles that mm -hmm. are specifically made uh, where it doesn't damage. Now, of course, if you use it, it there is a certain level of wear and tear. Um, but it would take years of going back and forth on that same part of the record for the wear and tear to actually occur. Wow. Um, yeah. So what's, what's the needle made out of? Do you have any uh, idea? It's a, it's a diamond tip. Oh, it's, hmm. a, it's a diamond tip. Yeah. Wow. I'm learning all kinds of stuff today, Bobby. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, the, I know it's on video and the audio folks can't see it, but this is one of the newer ones. This kind of, Oh wow! New age, yeah. So that little tip there, yeah, a little diamond tip on there that's specifically made for for uh, what they call back cueing, you know, spinning the record uh, backwards, right? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's re that's really cool. So, were you making a ton of money DJing? Um, you know, and uh, yeah, at, at at the peak, yeah, it was it was it was it was good money, even up to before COVID. Uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, making, making decent money. Um, thankfully, you know, I, I, you know, when I, when I started DJing, um, you know, we do stuff for free house parties and stuff, a bunch of house parties. Um, and I can't even remember if they paid me. I think I just did. I loved it so much. I might've done it for free. Um, but then everybody, you know, people thought you were the coolest person cause you were the DJ at the party, you know, like you were like the celebrity there, you know, you were the person in complete control of the event. Like you had the entire party in the palm of your hands. What you decided to play for them was what they were going to listen to. So it, it was it's actually a pretty powerful position to be in uh, looking back. Um, but it's a fun position to be in too. Yeah. Well, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So was it ever your main uh, source of income at any point? No, no. Uh, I thought about it. But my parents were always my parents initially were completely against, it. you know, you know, parents coming here like we didn't bring you to this country to for better opportunities for you to become a DJ. Uh, you need to go to school, you need to do this, do that. And so they were always against it. And there was always that that negativity there. So, um, you know, uh, looking back, uh, it was a good thing because I, 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 I always uh, had a day job so to speak, uh, even after high school. I've, I've, I've had a day job since I, I started working right out, out of high school. Um, you know, a little bit here and there. It's not like a career. It's just a day job, just like anybody else would have. Um, but I always kept some type of employment as a backup because I just didn't want to trust DJing 100% um, because it's just the, the volatility that's involved. You know, you could be uh, doing very well and then all of a sudden things dry up like it, like mm -hmm. in a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but you know, before that it was like, you know, when I, when I started to get into the club scene uh, you know, the promoters would, would book you if they, if they heard you at a different club and they liked you, they would bring you to do their parties and whatever, but nothing was guaranteed. Nothing was guaranteed at any minute they could replace you with another DJ. So uh, that lack of security uh, always kind of kept me from, not DJing full time, but I got I got to have a bunch of friends that DJ full time, and they they are very successful, and they tour the world. Uh, mm. uh, they they're producers, uh, you know, and I came up with these guys. Um, uh, 
and you know if you if you if you saw one of their uh you know tour if you saw one of their tour dates um it, it's amazing like you know one night they're in london you know, the next night they're in dubai mm. two nights later they're in, in japan and they just traveled the world and playing dance music and it's just uh, amazing um and i've caught up with them you know in miami at, at uh, music conferences and things and uh you know great for them and they're still they're still doing it uh, making music some have record labels and things like that so i just never felt comfortable enough to, to pursue it that 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 you know that way it takes a lot of guts to uh to do something with no uh with no backstop with nothing to yeah. fall back on yeah now had my parents been a little bit more supportive and not you know been so anti there, there were some times where I could have, like there was, there was some time where some folks uh, approached me to go on tour uh, with a, with a hip hop group. Um, you know, it was a local artist, but that's how you, you know, expand and meet people. And, you know, my parents won't let me, I couldn't go. Um, so if it wasn't for them, I may have, but you know, in hindsight, I'm not mad at them. Are, are your parents anti, well, they care, they cared about you and loved you and wanted things to go well for you. It probably felt super risky to them. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Are they supportive now? Oh, absolutely. My mom, my, my mom's like, when are you, when are you doing another live set? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. My, my dad's like, you know, encouraging me. Like, hey, when are you playing? This? There was a couple of times my dad was like, hey, I, uh, a friend of mine has this, uh, this bar in Arlington. Would you be interested in playing there? I'm like, this is like completely different from like 25, 30 years ago where you were telling me, you better not do this. <laughs> now you're telling me to go work with. So, yeah. So, yeah. They, yeah. They yeah. see that they, they see that um, I'm able to make good money. It's fun, and I didn't get strung out on uh, drugs and become an alcoholic. Which yeah, is and you, probably and you, their biggest fear that you know I would get into the wrong crowd and start doing drugs and you know be laid up in the uh, in an alley somewhere. So when they saw that you know that didn't happen and and you know I'm making good money, they were like then they were you know supportive and and uh encouraging but they always said make sure you have health insurance <laughs> yeah it's the same thing my, my wife says i, I want to go do things that uh where i don't have health insurance uh covered by a company and she's like you can't leave your current situation you're you don't you won't have health insurance i'm like you can pay for it yourself you don't have, a, have to have a company do it for you uh but it, it, it is a lot more expensive when you're uh, an entrepreneur or doing something on your own absolutely yeah <laughs> Well, it's a good lesson for parents. Uh, if if your child enjoys it, is passionate about it, and it seems to bring fulfillment, then I, th I think it's okay for uh, parents to let, let their kids fly in that direction. But yeah, the drugs Absolutely. and alcohol is definitely a concern because uh, there are those that, nightmare stories in, in the entertainment industry. Oh, yeah, and, and, and that, you know, late night, dark clubs, loud music, that's where that whole scene flourishes. Right, right. So what, what's your... Uh, What's, what's the day job or, or uh, your your main gig? What's what's that typically look like for you? What do you well, what are you doing now? Uh, right now, uh, my day job, since I'm not DJing uh, anymore because of COVID for the time being, uh, I work for uh, a GW Hospital, and uh, my position is kind of like a not really administrative, but um, uh, I my my title is patient family liaison and uh i work with the surgical department we average uh pre-covid we averaged anywhere from 60 to 75 surgeries a day monday through friday so my uh, responsibilities was to maintain uh the communication level between mm -hmm. the uh operating rooms um you have 18 operating rooms at gw uh the communication from the operating oh, wow. rooms uh the recovery room and the patient's family in the waiting area and family. So all that communication, uh, you know, goes through me and I, uh, you know, pass that along. And I also, uh, you know, take care of uh, consultations with the surgeon when the, when the surgery is over. Um, I you know, connect the surgeon with the families, uh, uh, you know, a lot less now because the, the traffic is, is not as much in the hospital because of the limited uh, capacity or limited number of uh, visitors that are allowed now. But that's basically my job. Uh, so it's like a patient advocate would be the best way to sum it up. Do you, do you have to uh, share bad news with the patients or the patient's family? Uh, no, fortunately, uh, no. The uh, 
uh, the, surger, the, the surgeon always speaks to the family uh, when, when they're finished. Uh, so they always come down and speak to the family. Um, so they would pass along any, uh, you know, uh, information. Um, but fortunately, in the 11 years I've been there, there uh, haven't been very many uh, instances where they had to give bad news to families. Uh, of course, there are, you know, uh, you know, emergencies and uh, trauma is what we call when they come through, uh, you know, gunshot wounds, stabbings, domestic violence, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, those cases aren't planned. You know, when I, when I say, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, the majority of, uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the planned surgeries that we've had that, that I've been you know during the time I've been there, uh, we haven't had to pass along uh, any too much uh, bad bad news, uh, but with those traumas, you know, it does happen unfortunately a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, tell me about your your most fun or, or biggest or the one you remember uh, the most fondly uh, out of your DJing gigs. Like, did, have you played in front of thousands of people? I have. Yeah. That is, that's wild, man. It's yeah. You. Uh, initially when I first started playing for larger crowds like that, you know, you get, you get butterflies, you know, that, 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 that whole butterfly in your stomach, it's, it's real. Like you start to get nervous and you tense up and it's like, and um, I, I don't like to eat before a large gig because I don't want to have food in my system and have, you know, get nervous and have to go to the bathroom or eat. You know, I just, it just freaks me out. So I don't right. eat. <laughs> 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 and my wife makes fun of me you know my sister used to make fun of me and i'm like just eat something i'm like no i'll eat afterwards and that's probably why djs end up eating breakfast at four o'clock in the morning after their dj gig because you know you don't eat anything beforehand but um yeah it's you know the butterflies you get nervous and then once you once you kind of get into the groove of things you see the crowd dancing and having a great time it kind of goes away but then the next time it comes right back um but i can't remember the uh it, it just all of a sudden just stopped happening. And I, I stopped having butterflies, you know, yeah. just uh, became kind of a normal thing to play in front of large crowds like that. And uh, it, it kind of went away. What's the largest cool. crowd? Um, probably about three to 4,000. Wow. Is that outside or is that inside? No, it was indoors. Yeah. yeah it was a, it was a indoor, uh, uh, indoor, uh, the, the one I'm specifically thinking of, um, was a was at UVA it was a college party and it was a big big area that had and uh yeah it was uh there were other ones but this, this is the main one when, when people say large crowds because you know there were some fun fun uh stories and things that happened and you know different DJs and stuff so it kind of uh, stuck in my mind but yeah so uh yeah it was indoors um I have done some outdoor events but nothing like like you know stadiums or anything like that but those uh DJ buddy of mine's that I was telling you about they have played in stadiums where you have like 15,000, 20,000 people. And so like the top 10 DJs in the world, you know, some of those guys uh, right now, probably not. Um, but about 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. There were, there yeah. were a handful of them that I knew. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Some were nominated for Grammys. Uh, um, I mean, there some of them, I mean, if you're in the music uh, scene, uh, you know, you, uh, folks may, may recognize some of the names, but uh, some of them may not necessarily be household household names. Got it. Yeah, three or four thousand people at UVA is like fifteen to twenty percent of the student population. It was UVA. a huge party. It was great. That, was, that, that is was, that is a amazing. massive party. You had butterflies. <laughs> it was massive. You had butterflies before that when you had to. We did. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So uh, let, let's talk about your your family a bit. Your your you got kids. You have a really young kid, really young kid too. Yeah. Yeah. I have a 22 year old daughter from my previous marriage and, um, uh, I, uh, have a two year old, um, uh, from my current marriage. That is quite the spread, man. It is. It is. <laughs> I always tell people, you know, I, I thought I was done with diapers and then, uh, you know, it just goes to show how women have a way of making you do crazy things. <laughs> yes, they do. They have, they they are very powerful in that way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But your two year your two year old you're watching your two year old now while you're doing this podcast. So she's sleeping, right? Yeah, a uh, uh, boy. Or yeah, boy. He's, sorry, uh, he's he. upstairs. No, no. Uh, yeah, he's he's uh, taking his afternoon nap right now. So 
Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Zia. Z-I-A. Nice. I like that. And, you, and your name is, was not Bobby until you came to the States, right? What, what was your name? No, my, given my name? Uh, given name is Bobak. It's uh, spelled B-A-B-A-K, which is not phonetically spelled because it's uh, pronounced Bob and Back, like Bob Back. But uh, I, I know several Bobaks uh, that here in the U.S., um, I work with a, a, a surgeon at GW. His name is Bobak, and everybody spells it that way. Uh, you know, that's that's how our parents spelled it. Um, and that's probably why I decided to just go with Bobby as a nickname, because people would just mispronounce it so much. Cool. Tell, tell us about your uh, current wife. Your, I, uh, I should say current wife, your wife. Tell us about your wife. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm definitely not trying to get you in trouble. <laughs> this is the love of your life, your wife. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, her name is Erica. Um, I met her a few years ago um, through music. Uh, coincidentally, she used to uh, uh, live in the D.C. area and would frequent uh, my events. And, um, you know, like the music that I played and just would, would come and, and, and listen and uh, kind of followed me, as, as she said, tells me now. Uh, and um, she moved to New York briefly. And I remember her reaching out to me one time. I, I lost a couple of my gigs. It just happened that, you know, two or three gigs kind of fell through. And uh, there was a period where I wasn't DJing. Uh, and she actually reached out to me. Um, and, I, didn't, I you know, we had never met. And she was like, hey, you know, I've I, I followed you for years. I, I appreciate what you do. Uh, if there's anything I can do to, to help you find gigs, I'm in New York, whatever, you know. And I thought it was really nice. And then she came back to D.C. and she came to a couple of my events. We met, we started talking, uh, got along, and uh, uh, now we're married. She's now, great. Now you have a son together. Yes. Yes. And I'm uh, wiping butts and uh, changing diapers. <laughs> I never uh, should have answered that first call. No, I'm kidding. I love it. I love it. I'm joking. It's all good. And so obviously y'all live in uh, Northern Virginia, uh, raising your son together. That's great. Uh, so you mentioned Miami. You mentioned New York. Did did were you going up and down the coast to do these gigs? No, no, I wasn't. Um, I'm uh, pretty much a local guy, uh, mainly because my uh, area of specialty is hip hop, and as you can imagine, every city. Every town has a hip has a, a bunch of hip hop DJs, uh, um, so there wasn't a need for me to travel outside of this area to necessarily play what uh, you know their local DJs can play. Um, the difference between the the hip hop DJ culture and the dance music uh, DJ culture is um, years ago uh, in the nineties. And 2000s, a lot of the dance music DJs, the electronic dance music, I, I want to say EDM is, is the is mm. the abbreviation, but EDM doesn't always uh, right now it has kind of a negative connotation because the music is so watered down. But that's another story. But electronic dance music, like house music and techno and things like that, those DJs tend to also produce music. So they had a higher probability of getting booked for overseas and out of town gigs because of the music that they produced. Mm. So, so even though another DJ could play it, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it just made more sense. It was more appealing to the audience that, Hey, this is a super popular song and the DJ that produced it is going to be DJing tonight. So uh, that's the, you know, one of the main differences why, dance music DJs uh, toured a lot and still continue to tour uh, and hip hop DJs for the most part don't. Now, of course there are, you know, there are some, some uh, A-list uh, hip hop DJs like Quest Love and Jazzy Jeff and, and a host of others. I'm, I'm not, you know, no disrespect to God, you know, the list is so long, but those guys, you know, get booked uh, for out of town gigs a lot uh, and they travel a lot, but uh, for the most part, the average hip hop DJ, typically doesn't so i have played out of out of uh country after out of town uh i've been flown out to different places to to dj specific events because you know i've, I've uh, somebody flew me out to san diego to do a dj uh, to dj their wedding um i've played at a couple of gigs in canada um uh minneapolis um 
North Carolina, Chicago, you know, but mostly for weddings. Uh, and these were folks that kind of uh, listened to me uh, in clubs in, in, in the DC area. And um, when they were ready to get married, they wanted, uh, you know, my style of music and vibe at their wedding. So, um, you know, they had moved to different areas, uh, you know, where life takes, takes you and they reached out to me and, and flew me out to, to, to DJ their weddings and things. So, um, and that was a great experience, but, uh, uh, but that, that, yeah, that's mainly how I, I played out of town and, and in Canada. Well, Canada wasn't, wasn't a, uh, wasn't a wedding. That was a, a little mini tour that we went on. Uh, uh, and I played at a couple of clubs since we were in, you know, out of town, they booked me and I did a radio show, but, uh, which was cool. But yeah, the other, the other ones out of, out of town stuff was all pretty much just weddings. So and they flew me out, which was cool. That's yeah, very cool. When, when Tim and your sister got married, what was the music? at the reception um it was a it was it was a mixture uh of, of a lot of you know some some of the uh, popular hip-hop at the time of course you know you have the uh middle eastern uh part of the family there so you can't play american music the whole time so it was a lot of persian music uh the dj they picked was a was a pretty well-known dj from the baltimore area um that you know my sister knew and worked with and and, and liked and then, so that's how he ended up getting the gig which is how i ended up getting gigs um and, uh, you know, they had to give him the, the Iranian music because he, he didn't know anything about the Persian music or Iranian music. Um, but it was a, it was a mixture. Dance music, a little bit of hip hop, you know. Was there a discussion about you DJ no. for that wedding? No, no, no. I don't, I don't think my, my uh, uh, I think my sister wanted me to be there as, as a guest and a family member. Didn't want me to be occupied working the whole time. So, yeah, that's fair. That's completely yeah. fair. All right, yeah. out of all the, all the vinyl you have, single or album, what's your uh, favorite? What's your favorite vinyl? Oh my god, is that mind blowing? Is that is that too much to yeah. think about? Yeah, it is. It really is. If you can imagine, I got like forty thousand records, not not including like I have a, a pretty hefty uh, seven inch collection too. This the small ones I've uh, started to pull those out and, and go through and and then so not including those, I got a few thousand of those. But uh, the uh, forty thousand is just the the, the the twelve inch albums of singles. This well, that's a lot. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, hip hop has taken me uh, on a on a on a type of a uh, musical journey because uh, hip hop samples a, a lot of uh soul and jazz music from the 60s and 70s um so uh listening to it and wondering where those sounds and and melodies came from um got me into a lot of the music from uh that was sampled and not necessarily like like i was already in like disco and you know soul music and things like that i i, I like that but it but it introduced me to uh to to jazz uh and 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 a lot of like music that was uh, recreated and sampled for the song, but they, they weren't necessarily songs that you could uh, always play at a, at, a, at a party or an event, but they were really nice songs. Like uh, a lot of the mel melodies are, are taken from like love ballads just mm. because, you know, the singing and, you know, they kind of chop it up. So, so it's not, sometimes it's not recognizable, but that whole art of sampling uh, old music um, kind of took me in those directions. So I have a lot of seventies, jazz and 60s and 70s jazz funk and soul albums so it's really hard to pinpoint one yeah do you have all of uh, run dmc's albums every last one of them i, I was <laughs> crazy about run dmc when they when they exploded man i couldn't stop listening to them it was they were amazing they were amazing not only were they hip-hop but the, but the sound had had, had a fusion uh, a fusion of rock and roll in it which was was uh new and different at the time um so yeah i love run dmc I, I still have some shell toes Adidas uh, over here somewhere. Maybe not the one. Oh, look, you go, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> For our listening audience, Bobby has uh, left his laptop and he's grabbed. What have you grabbed here, Bobby? This is oh a shell toe gosh. Adidas. But check it out. Are you kidding me? Jam Master J. Yeah, that's, ja that's, Jam, that's Jam Master J on an Adidas shoe. Oh, my gosh. How did you get your hands on that? Oh man, it, it, I was in a sneaker shop a few years back, and it it was there, and I was like, "Yo, I gotta have this." So that could yeah. have caught that, that that had to cost more than fifty bucks, man. It did, it did. I'd rather not say because my parents and my wife might be listening. <laughs> See, I have a picture of Jam Master J on the on the tongue. Yeah, on the in on the, on the inside. inside, dude. Man, wow. So if you were to say which one of your sneakers is uh, you know, your favorites, this would probably be the one. 
we more How than once. Are, are you a shoe guy too? Do you buy a lot of shoes? Yeah. <laughs> do, do they all do they all fit in your townhouse? Uh, no, <laughs> not as bad as the records. Not as bad as records. I could probably fit the shoes here. I have probably maybe about 50, 40, 50 pairs here that's out that I have, you know, I can just go to grab and, 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 and put on, I have, you know, a couple of pairs that I've never worn before. That's all that, that doesn't sit well with people, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I don't know what it is about, I guess it just, it's all tied up intertwined in, in hip hop. Like a lot of DJs are also sneaker heads. So mm. yeah. How many pairs but, do you have total? Total. I probably, and in my collection, I always tell people I'm a, a sneakerhead on a budget because my emphasis has always been, oh, I got to go get this record. Oh, this new record came out. So I've, all my money's always going gone towards music. Uh, but uh, sneakers, occasionally I'll go and buy something that I, that I want to have and have to have. And then, you know, just kind of spiraled out of control a little bit. But I, maybe about 100, 100, 100, yeah, 110 pairs, somewhere around there, which That's sounds ridiculous to the average person. But, you know, like a real true sneakerhead, the kind of person that like camps out at the sneaker shop before they open uh, to buy something like two days ahead of time because uh, it's limited quantities. Those guys will have a couple thousand pairs. The, the second, like, yeah, the secondary market's crazy for shoes. Oh, it is. It's insane. It's insane. Like even even now, like um, uh, I know people that, that buy and sell shoes. Uh, Nike will, will release a limited edition of something. And uh, they, they pretty much mastered this. And uh, it'll be available on a limited quantity, limited basis on their website. Um, and in order to get it, you have to basically be lucky. Um, and if you, you know, those, it'll be, you know, they average about 100, 120 bucks a pair now. And it'll sell out within like two minutes. And it'll be available for sale on the resale market for like $2,000. Eighteen hundred dollars, you know, depending on on the shoe, what the concept is, what the theme, you know, how rare it is, it's insane. Yeah, I I, I don't get it. I I, yeah. I really don't. But it, I mean, I can't spend that. I mean, I love sneakers, and 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 if I had the money, I would probably spend it on something that I want just to have. Um, but. It, it is it's a little outrageous but then again i have forty thousand records so that's outrageous <laughs> wait, wait is there anything else that's outrageous in your life like vinyl oh, and uh, shoes shoot man I, I, you know i think i blame my dad a little bit because he was a collector he collected little knickknacks here and there when we were in iran um he uh collected uh keychains and matchboxes mm. random right so i remember seeing these collections and when he traveled on business he used to always bring me something back, you know, some kind of toy or something. Cause I'm little, like what else is going to bring? Me? My mom would take care of the clothes, I guess. Um, he would bring me and he got me into matchbox cars. So I had a huge matchbox car collection in Iran. And you left it there, didn't you? Most of it. I was, I, I managed, oh. you know, you know I mean? those little cases that you could put the matchbox cars in. Yeah. Um, I managed to bring like one or two with mm. me. I picked my favorites, and, you know, cause it, it, my dad had bought these for me. So they were all very special to me. Um, so, I, 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 but yeah, but the majority of it is, yeah. So are, are you ever going to sell any of the vinyl or, or are you going to leave, leave this earth and uh, the vinyl's going to stay in the family kind of thing? That, well, nobody in the family wants it. That's the problem. <laughs> well, maybe your, maybe your two-year-old does someday. That did maybe. Now, and, and my, my daughter has gotten into vinyl uh, in the last couple of years and, you know, similar to your daughter. And, um, you know, when, when uh, we could go out uh, comfortably and safely out um, on the weekend, sometimes we go to a record store and, and kind of like, you know, flip through records and I buy a few things. She buy a few things. Now she orders a bunch of stuff online. Um, so and she came and picked out a few of, of my things like, you know, she's like, oh, you had that Beyonce album. You know, when she was a little kid, she didn't know about Beyonce, but now she's older. She's like, oh. I'm like, yeah, I have a copy of it. She's like, can I borrow it? I'm like, mm, yeah, but it's make sure you understand it's borrow. Like, I'm not <laughs> giving you anything. So she may want some of them. My son may want some of them. I have uh, told my daughter on numerous occasions that if I die, and this was before I got married and had another kid, I told her, um, 
if I die and you sell my records, I'm going to come back and haunt you. <laughs> so wait, wait, from your perspective, it needs to stay in the uh, family forever. I, you know, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't make sense for it to stay in the family forever. Like who would take care of 40,000 records? You, can you imagine moving? Like I've only moved that collection twice, twice. When I got married the first time and when I got a divorce. Mm. Because mm. that I had to keep, I had to make sure that those those were safe. I didn't want to come home one day and then be out in the front yard. So, uh, it's it's a major undertaking. It's a major undertaking. Like these three thousand uh, records that I have here, I brought from my apartment. And then when we got married, when we moved to this townhouse, you know, I had to move these. These I think took about forty five or fifty, like those U-Haul boxes. Yeah. Um, U-Haul makes these boxes that are perfect for vinyl. Like, they're not made for vinyl, but it, it's like a little over 12 inches wide and uh, maybe about 15, 16, in, maybe 18 inches. Perfect for vinyl. Took like 45 boxes. To move 3,000. To move 3,000. So it would literally take a, 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 a tractor trailer to move 40,000. Or maybe two. Or maybe two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, th- th- this is another funny story about, about these records. My wife wants to uh live somewhere tropical mm. and i i love being around water i love the ocean but i told her i said there's no way i'm gonna put my record collection near that much water where there could be a tsunami uh, <laughs> well or <laughs> and salt salt water is uh put salt in the air and that salt is not good for most things either that too Yes. So, so yeah, so we struggle with that. So that's, I said, you know, look, if if we, you know, ever get to a point in our retirement or somewhere where we can afford to have a secondary home somewhere in the Caribbean or somewhere tropical where there's water, we have to have a place here in the States or somewhere high enough above sea level where my record collection will not get damaged or else I'm not moving. Mm. So, (laughs) So how many people before, t- before today knew, knew about uh, how many albums you had or how many vinyls you had? How many people? Yeah. Like in my family or? Or a total. How many people knew that you had such an immense collection? I mean, it's crazy. I had no idea you were going to tell me 40,000 vinyls today. Um, I think most of my friends knew. Okay. Um, and uh, within a DJ community, a lot of my friends know. Uh uh, yeah, my parents definitely know. Um, not everybody has seen it, uh, but you know, if anybody, you know, uh, when I when has you know ever come to my parents' house or something like that, and went in the basement, you know, some family, some some a very few people have seen the collection. Um, but you know, um, in person, the three thousand behind you. What, what are the dimensions of uh, top to bottom and all the way left to right? What is that like? Eight feet um, by 10 feet? Eight feet by maybe 15-ish. So, That's so a eight, good question. Eight feet by 15 feet, and it, and we're only seeing the super narrow side of the of the vinyl. And it's yeah. packed. It's, it's packed, packed, yeah. It's packed. And I, I have stuff all over the floor, too. I'm kind of calculating, yeah. Yeah, but I mean... In, uh, in the in the video, uh, you can see four sections. You know, you see that top section. There's four right. sections. Yeah. Uh, this shelving unit that I use, um, that I have, you know, all my other uh, records in, you can have up to, f- from floor to ceiling is six sections. Mm. Um, so here I have some on the fifth row, but the bottom row is just kind of hard to get to because this room is small and I got other stuff stored in there, so I don't have the full setup. But where where the bulk of my collection is, it's it's actually six six uh, sections, um, uh, you know, tall, uh, yeah. tall, and then yeah. Wow, do other DJs have that much vinyl? Or you, um, you you may have a world record on your hand, Bobby. No, there 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 are there are a lot of. Uh, 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 of DJs that have uh, large collections like this. Um, I don't know how many, um, but the, the two DJs I mentioned earlier, uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff from Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Yeah. For, uh, uh, he has an immense uh, vinyl collection. He's a producer also. So, um, you know, he has a lot of stuff that he, he bought to, to sample, like you know, a lot of the old jazz and soul and funk that I was talking about. So, um, so he, you know, there, so there are DJs like that. Um, but in the area that I like, you know, within my group of, of folks, I, 
I may have more than all the DJs in the, I may have the record in the, in the DC area, but I'm not going to say that hundred percent because there may be some unknown DJ somewhere or even a well-known DJ that doesn't, you know, you know, that they just have as many records as I do and they just never talk about it, you know, cause there's a lot of, because if you think about it, vinyl was the only way you could DJ at a certain point. Right. Right. Properly, properly in a nightclub, you could, you know, th there were no CDs, CDs weren't even in yet. Uh, and even when they were, dance music and things like that, they, they weren't making CDs and, and the equipment like, you know, weren't readily available. Now you can DJ with MP3s. I, I do it too, unfortunately. I prefer vinyl, but, you know, it's a necessary evil. Right. Uh, but, so there are a lot of DJs who, who uh, may have been in, in this business as long as I have, who may have this many records or at one point had it, converted it to digital and then sold it. So, um, but as far as I know, like the, the 30, 40 DJs that I know, I may have the biggest collection. I, I, I'm, I'm floored by the, just what I see behind you and then multiply by 13. I, I don't get it. <laughs> it's a lot, man. It, it is. A, it's, it, whoo, whoo. I, don't, I don't like moving. Moving is terrible. Oh, but it would have to be. Yeah. Yeah. So when do you think your next next gig's going to be? Because it sounds like you haven't played since February March time frame. Yeah, yeah, March uh, mid March was my last gig, and I remember, um, and I, I you know I had my schedule set up for March, and I was working on my uh, April schedule and, and confirming. You know, I had some some regular uh, weekly gigs, and you have some monthly gigs, and then you have some you know uh, one offs here and there for a special like a rooftop party or whatever. So I was working on my schedule, and then everything hit the fan. Um, so yeah, mid. Uh, March and I, I remember being at the last one I went to was questionable because um, the numbers were still very low, but it was it was spreading and, uh, and my wife was scared and you know of course you know uh, we have a we have a baby and my my parents are elderly and my dad has you know uh, heart issues and you know it's just it's 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 scary so I I remember debating whether I should go to that one or not and I was like you know what let me just go to this one. And that was the last one. After that, it was just like pfft. the following week, it was like mandatory. Even if I wanted to go, the, the, yeah, everything just got shut down. So uh, mid-March. Uh, but things are starting to open back up a little bit. I'm a little hesitant because of the baby. Um, um, you know, they don't, they, don't, they don't have enough research uh, to know exactly what the long-term side effects are, even for us. But, you know. We got, we got to do it. You know, a lot of people are uh, anti-vax and I eh, kind of am, but something like this, uh, I was like, you know, and I work in healthcare. So I'm, I'm around COVID patients. Uh, not as much as I don't work in a COVID unit per se, but they come in to be tested before surgery. So we don't know if they have it until they get tested. So, right. um, and then occasionally we'll have some patients in a recovery room that, that, that are positive. So it's just, it's scary. So, uh, but as far as the gigs, um, uh, there are some new places opening up in DC and I am working uh, with someone right now, uh, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, and, uh, there's a new club opening up and, um, they asked me to be one of their, uh, regular resident DJs. And, uh, we don't know when things are going to open back up yet or when, when DJs will be allowed in clubs right now, you can just, you know, have a minimum capacity and, and, um, uh, have the music played, uh, you know, through the speakers, you're not allowed to have a live DJ or, or live performances yet in the dc area so but uh uh hopefully within the next couple of months we'll start to gradually get back out there i'm looking forward to it very cool so i'm, I'm going to uh twist your brain here a little bit bobby how old sure. do you think you're how old do you think your son's going to be when he listens to this recording oh wow it's not it's mm -hmm. not next week right <laughs> no no because he won't he won't remember <laughs> uh but um you know my wife is um, really good about making sure he learns about uh, both the American and uh, Iranian cultures and, you know, just very family oriented and uh, is really big on like uh, culture and family history and, and uh, you know, uh, just just everything family uh you know she's very family oriented and and from from that perspective i can see her 
maybe playing this audio or video for her for him um, when he's maybe nine, 10 years old, old enough to, you know, uh, appreciate it, possibly. Um, but he probably won't truly appreciate some of the crazy things we've talked about till, you know, late teens or early 20s. Yeah. And, and he'll probably listen to it a few times, maybe every five to 10 years kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah, very cool. Well, hey, Bobby, it's great having you on. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, doing this with us. Uh, I learned more than I expected to learn today about you. Uh, I, the good news for me, I think, is I will never purchase a single vinyl <laughs> for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, and you've got 40,000. Wow. <laughs> you got to buy, you, gotta, you have to buy some for your daughter. I will buy them for my daughter. I will not buy them for myself, though. <laughs> very, very cool. Hey, Bobby, just uh, do me a favor. Hang on for a second while I stop the recording. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no worries, man. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.